Hi, in the previous video linked in at the end and down below if you haven't seen it and you must watch it because this is part two. We looked at uh, four different passive oscilloscope uh, probes. The switchable 1 to 10 probe, the fixed uh, times 10, the high voltage probe and the uh, transmission line uh, resistive probe. And these were all passive probes. But now in this video we're going to take a look at what pretty much can be called all active probes because they contain some sort of active amplifier circuitry. Our first one we got is the high voltage differential probe. This is the EV Blog HVP70. It's a 70 megahertz high voltage uh, differential probe. It's uh, designed for measuring, look, 1000 volts RMS max. But you might think, well, this one can do 5 kilovolts and this one only does 1000 volts. What's the difference? Well, you remember I said this is Mains Earth reference and I've done that uh, video on how not to blow up your oscilloscope. You cannot use one of these, or you can't use one of your other probes because if you hook your ground point up, that is like connecting mains earth to any point on the circuit that you connect this through and you can come a gutter and you can blow up your product, your board, whatever. You can even blow up your oscilloscope. You blow up your leads, uh, you can really have a bad day. So unless the ground of your product is actually um, isolated from mains earth, you can't just go sticking this ground probe willy-nilly anywhere in your circuit because you can come a guts up. And things like, uh, you know, mains switching power supplies or other things, they're of course, uh, you know, mains earth reference. So um, yeah, you plug this on the wrong point and it's just going to vaporize. But what the uh, high voltage differential probe does is let you, lets you safely put either the ground or the positive lead anywhere in your circuit. Well, as long as what the uh, maximum is, is here, a thousand volts RMS and your common mode, which is uh, connected through to ground, plus minus uh, 700 volts, good enough for any, like, you know, main switch mode power supply. You can just connect your probes up to anywhere and you're gonna be completely safe. You're not gonna blow up your circuit. You're not gonna blow up yourself. You're not gonna blow up anything. These are great high voltage differential probes. Okay, just a quick recap with Dave Cad here on what uh, this common mode uh, voltage actually means. Well, this high voltage differential probe, it basically is just a differential amplifier. It's just an amplifier like this that measures the voltage difference between the positive and negative input terminals like this. And then it multiplies it by, amplifies it by a gain of 10 or 100, depending on where you uh, set the switch. And then it just goes out to the B and C here to your oscilloscope. And of course, the oscilloscope is going to be made earth to reference. So um, what this voltage here, 1000 volts RMS maximum uh, between the two terminals here, it's exactly as it uh, says. It says you can have up to a maximum of 1000 volts RMS or basically uh, the linear range, uh, the measurement range, plus minus 700 volts uh, between these terminals, either directions. So good enough for like mains measurement and things like that. And you can get higher voltage versions of these which go much higher. I think this is actually one of the uh, lowest voltage ones on the market with uh, times 10 uh, times 100. And we might explain why in a minute. Anyway, uh, common mode voltage, what that means is that between either of these inputs here, either one, positive or negative, and this um, output, it's uh, output referenced, and the output is of course going to your oscilloscope, which is mains earth reference. So that's connected through to your mains, which then could be connected back through your PowerPoint, through to your product, and I've done that whole video on how not to blow up your oscilloscope, so I won't uh, recover all that. But basically this probe can handle up to plus minus 700 volts between, this is a voltage source here, between either of these terminals and the output mains earth referenced here. This is why you can pretty much much um, for most uh, practical circuits that are mains powered or uh, lower voltage you can connect your two probes up to any point in your circuit and you're not going to blow up anything you're safe to measure any point in your circuit. So you could measure across, you know, like a shunt resistor in there or something like that to get the current waveform or whatever it is. Now here's a reverse engineered uh, Dave Cat drawing of a similar uh, model to this one from the manufacturer, uh, Sapphire. This one will be exactly the same, just uh, some twite and just some performance uh, tweak differences. This is how these high voltage differential probes work. And there's a, a big common misconception about uh, these uh, high voltage differential probes. People think that they're actually isolated that the uh, inputs uh, are somehow, you know, transformer or other isolated from the input. Well, that is not the case. All these things do is actually contain large value input resistors. In this case, it actually tells you down here, read it, four meg each side 
to ground and 5.5 puff and that's exactly what you get you get four one mega resistors to ground here's the ground terminal here is the output uh the reference i haven't drawn it but output ground over here like this and this comes from my uh, reverse engineering drawing so i'll link that one in but basically yeah that is connected through to here so it's look it there it is it's connected right through a <laughs> four meg resistor and they've got a low value down here 25 so it's just a resistor divider in each leg and then they've got a uh, FET uh, differential amplifier here and some extra uh, gain stage times 10 times 100 selected and that's it that's all that's inside one of these things but because they've got such high value resistors you can plug them anywhere in your circuit and it's not going to cause a problem but of course it could potentially load down your circuit if it's a really high impedance circuit of course but that's the same with any probe. These things don't really perform as good as a proper oscilloscope one. This is only uh, 70 megahertz bandwidth and with these long leads on the input okay you've got to twist them to get even half decent uh, performance and yeah they're just not as good a performance as proper oscilloscope probes but they're incredibly safe and that's the reason that you want to use one of these and you can probe any point in your circuit using a ground referenced oscilloscope. They're just uh, like they, they can't be beat. But the downside is, is that because they have to have such large resistor divider ratios in order uh, to be safe, then, well, they're not great for low level measurements, which is why you won't find a high voltage, uh, which is why they're called high voltage differential probes. You won't find a, well, there are some low voltage differential probes, but uh, like, yeah, they're generally um, high voltage because they have to have a huge divider ratio like that. And these are either uh, battery powered, in this case of this one, uh, four AA batteries in the back, or you can uh, power them because the power is uh, output uh, reference, you can actually power them uh, from the USB port on your scope here if you've got an adapter cable. And our next probe, guaranteed to get every engineer all excited. Oh, it's the Active FET probe. And they always come in impressive cases like this and this and this <laughs> right you never just oh, get like a little like probe in a packet whatever no they always come in beautiful cases like these let's take a look at them so here's a very typical active probe or the active FET probe or just FET probe because they've all got uh, FETs right at the input here that actually uh, amplify the signal before it comes in so they have active amplifier electronics inside the head as opposed to your passive probe here, which is just a, basically a bit of a, a resistor and a bit of coax and the amplifier is inside the scope. Well, in this case, the amplifier is up here, which means they, they have to actually be supplied by power. And it's very common for them to actually be powered from the oscilloscope under test. And look at these oh, lovely little pogo pins. And you usually buy them from uh, the manufacturer of the oscilloscope because they've got their own interface. This one is your Agilent uh, key sight. So those probes uh, not only give it power, but they also, you know, Know, tell it what type of probe it is and, and things like that. Your signal doesn't actually come out on these pins. This is just power and um, other data. Your uh, signal, of course, goes into your input to your scope. So it's just, that's a regular B and C, but it just plugs in, it's all captive, and they usually have a little lever in there to clamp on the front of your scope. So these things are usually very pricey, you know, they start in the four digit category and uh, go up to like five digits. And this one here is a two gig uh, bandwidth probe, uh, 10 to one uh, divider ratio, one meg uh, input impedance, and this uh, signal one here, active probe, it's a, it's one gig uh, with one meg ohm and uh, 1.2 picofarads. Uh, but you might think, well, okay, Okay, this is one gig well so is this what's the difference well the difference is remember this is like practically the world's best passive probe 3.9 puff this one 1.2 puff and that's the difference you remember our formula before capacitance is the thing that matters at high frequency and in the case of this uh, Siglent Active uh, probe compared to this Tektronix one, both are one gig rated probes, but because it's only 1.2 uh, puff, it's 132 ohms at one gig, whereas the passive probe is 40 ohms at one gig. So that can make a heck of a difference to the signal that you're actually measuring. That, lo that load is going on the line that you're trying to probe. So the lower the capacitance, the less you're going to load your line. But if you are talking uh, DC, then the passive probe's still better. That's 10 meg at DC. These are only a meg. 
So you'd use an active FET probe over your passive probe when signal integrity at high frequency really matters. Well, A, these can go higher. This is actually the fastest uh, passive tender one uh, passive probe you can get at uh, 10 meg. This, and as I said, um, this thing with a resistor will, uh, you know, if you build it right, will actually outperform this. And these can actually go up to 10 gig. So uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so <laughs> the only solution basically for above one gig gig uh, measurement is either an active FET probe or a resistive probe. That's it. And if you're wondering, this uh, Agilent one is one puff input uh, capacitance, and this one here, haven't measured it, but it'll like it probably on be on par, something like that, in the order of a puff, half a puff maybe. So the great thing about active uh, FET probes is you, they can actually go beyond 10 gig and beyond the performance of a simple uh, resistive uh, probe like this. So if you're on the bleeding edge of measurement, um, you're you're really going to be wanting an active FET probe. So pretty much, um, as a ballpark, maybe anything over 500 meg, you want to if you'd be using an active FET probe or a properly uh, built and characterized resistive probe. And like it can cost you more money to actually characterize uh, this than to simply buy the already characterized active FET probe. And basically these single-ended uh, active probes pretty much stop at a couple of gigahertz. Anything over that, then you start talking a uh, fully differential uh, probe, but not high voltage like we looked at before. These would be low voltage uh, differential probes. High speed, low voltage. But the one downside with these things is Murphy can get really expensive. Like these probes can cost thousands of dollars, even into the six digit range. And their huge Achilles heel is the maximum input voltage. In this case, max input, 20 volts peak. Okay, seriously, you go over that and this probe will blow up. You'll probably find eBay's <laughs> filled with like, oh, this FET probe, um, yeah, sold as is. I would not be buying a sold as is <laughs> FET probe off eBay. Just saying. We've got one from uh, Caltech Electronics here. This one's a little bit more robust. We're talking uh, 40 volts uh, peak here. It's a 1.2 gig probe. Once again, uh, 10 to 1. This one's higher input capacitance though. Three puff. But as you can see, um, this one, you can get like generic ones. You don't have to get these ones designed for your specific uh, scope. Uh, you can get these cheaper ones um, that just plug into your, like any scope. And they're just actively powered once again uh, from just the USB port on the front of your scope. Nice. And as I showed before, these things always come with like all these accessories. Let's take a look at them because they're very interesting. So these are the ones that come with the uh, Caltech probes. You've got beautiful little ultra tiny mini grabbers there. You've got little uh, ground and uh, probe pins like that, spare ones, because you're going to be uh, using them all the time. Plus you've got like little uh, pins like that that you can plug into headers. And often on your designs, when you're, if you know you're going to be probing like you know, really serious designs, maybe on a prototype board, you don't necessarily need it on a production uh, layout, but on a, a prototype board, you're trying to get it working, you're measuring your high speed uh, DDR bus or whatever, then you might have uh, dedicated test points on there, even dedicated connectors for these high speed probes. And the uh, Siglent ones, once again, you get all these uh, like spare tips because you're going to be going through them like there's no tomorrow. You might even want to uh, directly solder the tips into your circuit so that you can physically uh, remove your probes. The most interesting kit comes with the uh, key sight one. Once again, you've got a little tube with all the uh, little pins in there. Geez, they don't give you many, do they? A bit of a tight ass, real expensive probe. You get ultra tiny mini grabbers. Once again, like these things are just <laughs> super, super tiny. And then you like plug into there and give you all sorts of other little uh, adapters like that. Um, and the most interesting thing is they give you uh, copper pads like this and they actually give you a bit of a chart here on you know some of the different uh, probe connection techniques. And, and this is not the video to go into really high frequency uh, probing techniques of course, but you can uh, look, you can plug directly into the head with some long leads like that and that'll give like you know 500 meg bandwidth here they're saying. Or uh, you know you can get a rigid probe tip with offset ground like that. So it plugs in and I love this uh, keyside 
inside head. It's got little LEDs on there that just light up so you can see where you're actually plugging your probe into. Very nice. And then you've got a spring tip with ground blade like this, uh, and that'll give you like two gig bandwidth. And then you've got uh, a copper pad, which you can solder onto your circuit, and that will give you like a flexible ground point. So, you know, often it's very difficult to apply pressure to like both of these points at the same time without one of them sliding around. Well, if you solder in like a large ground pad, like, like with that copper tape that they uh, supply, then, you know, you don't have to worry about your ground probe, probe sliding around, or you do have to keep an eye on it, because Murphy and Shaw will slide off and short out one of your other <laughs> pins, something on your expensive $100,000 prototype board. Trust me, I've worked on $100,000 prototype boards, and if you blew that up, uh, uh, yeah, you're going to be having a bad day. But once again, you know, that might be a slightly reduced bandwidth to, you know, this technique over here, which is going to provide a lower inductance uh, path. So it's going to, you know, you're going to get better performance out of it, something like that. And then you just got, you know, if you want to put just pin headers on your board for various uh, test signals and then little short cables, which run over and just plug into your probe tip. So all these different uh, solutions for probing and you can even invent your own. And as I said, a lot of designers will solder on like, uh, like coax connectors directly onto the board and things like that. So you can plug on your own probes, your own uh, resistive probes or active FET probes or whatever it is you're doing. So active FET probes, you can think of those as the uh, Rolls Royce of oscilloscope probes, really. They're very nice, but as I said, you know, roll your own with a bit of RG174 coax and, well, you can get similar performance if you do it well enough, but, oh yeah, these can't be beat <laughs> if you got the money. And these probes will uh, usually require 50 ohm termination on your scope, although this uh, Caltest uh, one here, it actually, well, it comes with a 50 ohm uh, terminator. Look at that, 2 gig, 50 ohm is series inline terminator, 2 watts. Oh, that's very nice. But this one actually lets you uh, use it with a 1 meg input impedance uh, scope, just so you know 50 ohm uh, termination. And it, it gives you an actual atten attenuation setting of uh, five times, so that's, you know, better for like low signal measurements. Nice. Okay, let's give you a probing example here. We've got a Raspberry Pi 3 for those uh, playing along at home, and we're going to probe uh, one of the memory pins on the bottom here. I don't care which one. I've just picked one at random. We're getting a signal on it. So I'm using the 2 gigahertz active uh, probe here, the N2796 overkill for what we're doing. Well, overkill for this scope anyway, because this is a uh, 500 megahertz bandwidth scope. So this uh, active FET probe, more than good enough uh, for measuring the bandwidth that we got here. So I'll use this uh, long lead here for my ground. I'll put it on the ground pin of the uh, connector there because that's just uh, very convenient. For those who care about such things, you can actually see what uh, point I'm probing. Where is it? I think it's there. Jeez, I can barely see that. This is where, you know, magnification uh, <laughs> comes in. Okay, I'm probing a point there. I don't know what it is. I don't care. There it is. There's our signal. It's made up of a whole bunch of uh, stuff, but basically uh, you can see, look, it's got some undershoot here. It's got a little bit of ring in there. It's got a little bit of ring in there. I'm going to hazard a guess that that's going to be due to our uh, long ground lead there, right? So that is our thing, but we've got actually higher frequency stuff in here. Look at this. Oh, I just happened to capture one there. Look at this. It goes down, up, we're at, uh, what, 10 nanoseconds per division. We're almost as fast as we can get here uh, with this uh, scope. But this actually does have some really fast uh, pulses in here. So something, you know, something, you know, the bus is switching. It's doing whatever. I don't know what pro uh, point we're probing. Check that out, right? There you go. Because that looks very sinusoidal, we're talking about that's our sine X on X interpolation there. So this is like... Sort of, once you see that, you know, okay, we're beyond the bandwidth of our scope here. These signals are just too fast. But anyway, let's just go back to here. Okay, so we'll just try and capture that sort of like the most frequent one there. There it is. Got it. Okay, so I'll store that. Right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually uh, change the ground into this. Instead of having this longer lead, I'm going to go for one of the shorter uh, little adapter, ground adapter pins we've got in there. And it looks like there's a little bypass cat. I've determined 
that this right hand side is the ground. So that's very convenient because that's right next to the point that I want to test. Otherwise, as I uh, showed before, like you might have to uh, like install one of those copper pads or something. You might have had to like scrape away some of the ground here or something like that and maybe put the copper tape over the top of the chip or something like that. Or you'd have to scrape away some other ground point somewhere or you know, soldering a little uh, contact loop pin or something like that. So here it is, I've got my little adapter. Careful, because you can stab yourself with these little bastards. There we go. So we have this little now ground pin, which can sort of like, you know, pivot around like that. And anyway, that will make better contact. And this will be a higher frequency probe because it's a shorter inductive path. So let's try that. We'll require the tongue at the right angle and probably some magnification here. Okay, I've got my ground point and I've got my probe point. Pan up, pan up. Okay, let's have a look. I've changed my uh, digitizer, definitely getting five gig samples uh, per second and I saved my reference waveform. So let's single shot capture that, see if we can get it. No, there we go, got it. Now I can actually uh, adjust that waveform there to show you. There you go, so the orange one I've got there is the reference uh, waveform and this new yellow one is the one that we just probed. And there you go, it is like, it's of course like the same wave shape. You can see it's got the uh, longer ground lead one, the orange one, has some extra undershoot there and comes back and takes more time to come back up like that. And the one up here got some extra wiggle, 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 yeah on the top there, some overshoot. And um, so, you know, there are differences in probing right there. But at the moment, this is the loading of the line with a one picofarad, one puff active probe, which costs a couple of thousand dollars. Okay, now I'm going to use my 500 megahertz uh, passive probe here. It's the N2843. It's 11 picofarads, okay? And yes, I've uh, compensated this. Um, you compensate it with your probe compensation on the front. So everything's hunky-dory. I'm using my low inductance, high frequency uh, ground probe attachment. So that's equivalent uh, to what we had before. So um, it, we should get, uh, because we've only got a 500 bandwidth scope uh, here, then the bandwidth of the probe isn't really going to matter that much. Hold my tongue at the right angle and probe this. I think I got it. But here's the interesting thing. I've changed uh, the reference waveform to my uh, low inductance uh, short ground one before. So the orange one is the best we could get with our active uh, probe. So the exact same ground point, basically the same ground length. And you can see that, well, you know, our wave shape's the same. But look, look at this. Um, it's a much higher level down here. Okay, this is uh, 200 millivolts uh, per division, so it's like, you know, 50 odd millivolts higher there, and it's actually lower down here, our yellow waveform there. So, you know, all, although we can see like the wave shape and everything up here, it's like when the bus is loaded differently, because that's what this little, uh, you know, ramp up here is going here. I don't know the architecture of the Raspberry Pi. It, it doesn't matter, but I know there's something happening there with there. And down here, we're actually seeing a larger drop across the uh, bus here, which is interesting, isn't it? I it. You know, there's significant differences here. This wasn't the exact example I wanted to show. I just, like, it's a random example. But you can see the difference here between a 500 meg passive probe and, and effectively, a, because of the bandwidth of the oscilloscope, a 500 meg active probe. They load down the circuit differently. And I know you want to see it. Okay, let's compare Dave's dodgy um, homemade uh, resistive probe here with a 1K resistor in the tip. We'll give that a burl. Got a 50 ohm uh, terminate that, but scope can do that. No worries. Tongue at the right angle, tongue at the right angle. Fix that. Oh. Oh, check this out. This is absolutely fan-freaking-tastic. Now, what we've got here, the orange waveform, of course, is our uh, reference active FET uh, waveform. That's a $2,500 active uh, FET probe. Yes, it is uh, compensated uh, because you do still have to compensate them and it stores it uh, internally because it knows the serial number of the probe, etc. And the yellow one is Dave's uh, do-it-yourself a couple of buck. <laughs> resistive probe. Look at this. What's going on here? Well, it's obvious um, that 
What's happening at this point right here is that the bus is actually uh, going open or something. I don't know the exact architecture of what's, uh, you know, the pin I'm actually uh, probing. It doesn't matter, right? It's like it's going open, uh, open. And because the probe is one meg DC resistance, look at that. Um, it's basically, it's not going to discharge. Maybe if we got like a longer time period, it'd eventually uh, do a similar, like eventually discharge or whatever. But you see that the bus has actively changed. But because we're now loading this bus down with a 1K resistor or a 1.05K resistor, because we've got the 50 ohm uh, terminator as well, it boom, this is an R, this looks like for all the world, and it is an RC discharge curve. So there you go. What's that? You know, 10 nanoseconds per division. I don't know. You can work that out, whatever, uh, for those playing along at home. But you can see how the uh, resistive probe um, actually uh, completely changes the circuit that you're actually measuring. So, uh, sure, like the signal integrity is excellent. Let's, let's take a look at this, actually. If you have a look at the bottom here, you can see that both of them undershoot almost exactly the same. But you remember how I said that the uh, resistive probe can actually be more tolerant of longer ground leads. I think they're both about the same length. I think they're practically near identical. Remember how I said uh, it can be more tolerant on these than active uh, FET probes. This might be an example of this because this is not, uh, you know, this is not some controlled experiment. This is just something I you know, slapped together willy nilly and um, this is the result that we actually got. But this is fascinating, right? They both undershoot exactly the same, but the active FET probe, the orange one, uh, actually, look, it overshoots again when and so, and it takes much longer to recover than the resistive probe. Look at that. So this could be an example of where this cheap ass do-it-yourself resistive probe is actually outperforming this two and a half thousand dollar active FET probe in terms of signal integrity. But once again, this is not a completely controlled experiment. But this is what you can actually get. But of course, the limitation is that it loads it down much more. 1K as opposed to 1 meg, right? There's a huge difference there. And you might know, oh, what's the difference between this uh, load? You know, look, it's, it's dropping with the 1K. Is that the effect of the 1K load over here? Well, it's actually not. If we actually uh, measure that, because you remember, um, it's a divide by 21 probe as opposed to the active FET probe, which is divide by 10. So if we actually... Uh, uh, set up our cursors here and uh, go. I've set them precisely to the same uh, ground point here. Our resistive probe is we're getting 55 millivolts there. So if you get your confuser out, 55 millivolts times 21, which is our probe, 1.155 volts. And this is a it looks like it's a 1.2 volt uh, bus. So it's like it could be like it's maybe 50 millivolts under, but we have to measure the other one actually. So if we adjust that, we're talking about uh, 60 millivolts there. So it's uh, actually precisely six divisions there and we were on uh, 200 millivolts per division. So that's precisely 1.2 volts. So the resistive probe is actually measuring 50 millivolts less and that could be the load, the extra loading of the 1K uh, load. Once you, you'd have to check out the uh, driving strength of the driver actually used in this, which is the whatever uh, micros used on the Raspberry Pi or whatever. But because, as I said, we can't actually put in a, a actual uh, ratio, it doesn't let us put in our own uh, user-defined value. It only does, um, you know, these fixed ones. But if it did, do that, um, then we could actually get, you know, well, we've, we've measured it. We we can see that it's basically 50 millivolts under. So that could be like an extra 50 millivolts uh, drop caused by the loading of the probe. That sort of seems to be the case. But once again, this isn't exactly a, a you know, really proper setup controlled experiment. But that's possible. And it's kind of like, you know, the sort of uh, value that I'd expect. But you can definitely see the loading there. And by the way, no, this is not just a, uh, like a freak uh, capture where no, you know, the bus did something different than before. This happens every single time. No matter how many times I capture this, um, the 1K probe is definitely totally different to the uh, <laughs> active FET probe here. And you can see, obviously, the bus was floating there and then it went boom. No, <laughs> I'm going to go actively low.
Next up, quite a common uh, requirement in electronics is to look at current waveforms. Not just measure it with your multimeter, but, you know, really see the waveform, what it's like. And this is where a current probe comes in. In particular, one of these clamp current probes, which have a Hall Effect uh, sensor and a core which just uh, clamps through it, so you put your wire through there, and you can measure your current simply and easily because of course if you try and use your regular oscilloscope probe okay how do you measure the current well you can put a current shunt into your circuit of course or you could design in a current shunt into your uh, circuit that's uh, relatively uh, common but then of course you've got the ground in issues sure you can use a differential probe but differential probes are uh, like designed for like high voltages they're not designed for low voltages across current shunts so you know pretty useless there so you'd need like a super expensive multi thousand dollar uh, differential high bandwidth uh like low voltage high bandwidth probe to actually do it well bugger that um yeah a current this is where the current probe comes in you can just put a loop of wire through it's not always convenient uh of course because well if you want to measure current in a circuit i'll show you another solution uh for that up next but if you've got like a wire available then a current clamp like this is absolutely fantastic. So there are a couple of uh, downsides, and hey, uh, you've got to have like a wire uh, accessible to uh, put your clamp uh, probe through like this. B is that they're usually only designed for higher currents, um, like in this uh, Mixig one here, the CP2100B, which I see and sell on the EV blog store, by the way. It's awesome value for money. Um, it has like only a 10 amp and a 100 amp range, and you can't really get a huge amount better than that unless you go like really exotic expensive so they're not for low current measurements. So let's say you wanted to measure the mains current consumption of a complex uh, product like this that either you own or you develop in or whatever. Well, that's actually quite difficult and, you know, you've got to get into the power supply and you've got to somehow, like, maybe get a loop through there or you've got to, like, install a current shunt and use some uh, isolated uh, or high voltage amplifier and it gets a bit, uh, you know, hairs on the back of your neck start uh, going up. But in this case... It's easy. There's our mains input cable for this. <laughs> There's our brown active wire. And we simply clamp around that. Bingo. That is our current waveform for this oscilloscope. As you can see, uh, pretty poor power factor, of course. You know, not terrific. And the good thing is most oscilloscopes will have support for current probes. So if I call up uh, the channel one menu here and we just go into probe like this, and I, units, um, you know, any good scope these days will have volts and amps. So that's why I was able to have 200 milliamps, if you're paying attention, you would notice it, 200 milliamps per division. So this has support for current probes. And of course, you can set, just like uh, the uh, ratio of your uh, voltage probe, you can set the ratio of your current probe. And of course, you set that to match the value on the front here. Once you've done that, bingo, it's calibrated. Bob's your uncle, you can measure, that's our mains waveform for this scope. Brilliant. Try and get that, that simply any other way. It's just, ugh, no. <laughs> so you can now get these for like a couple hundred bucks with like you know, two megahertz bandwidth, isn't too shabby, okay? Um, the lower cost version of this does like uh, 700 kilohertz or something. So unless you go for some exotic, uh, expensive, like, you know, Tektronics 1 manufactured by grey-bearded uh, nude virgins that might have, you know, 50 or 100 megahertz bandwidth or something like that, then, you know, they are fairly bandwidth limited, but good enough for most uh, switch, switch, nah, switch mode power supply stuff. So yeah, current clamp probes. Highly recommend you get one. They're great. Next up, we've got our most unusual probe on this list, and it's the positional current probe. It's unusual because, well, as far as I know, please correct me in the comments, but only one manufacturer in the world makes this, and it's the AIM TTI iProber 520. And if you've been watching, I did this uh, review back in this back in 2012. So, yeah, it's been around for a while, but still nobody else has done anything. Now, you remember before when I said with those clamp current probes, you've got to have a wire available. You either got to have like a wire as part of a harness or you've got to break into your uh, PCB and actually wire in a big loop of wire so that you can get the big current probe head over it and things like that. Well, what if you don't want to do that or you can't do that for whatever reason? Well, this is where the positional current probe comes in. With this, it has a magnetic uh, sensing head on here that 
is, as per its name, a positional current probe. All you've got to do is put your probe over a trace on your PCB and it can measure the current flowing through it. And I've done a whole review of this and I'll link it in. But uh, basically, it's got a calibrator in there. I'm not sure if you can see that. There's a little trace in there, okay? There's a little PCB trace. Okay, at the moment, it's basically uh, zero like this. If I put it in there, I've got it to generate an AC uh, current. I can't remember how much, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, 50 milliamps or something throw it, flowing through it. If I put that there, bingo, look at that. <laughs> There's current flowing through that trace, an AC current. And if I turn it, if I rotate it like this, this is why it's called a positional current probe because it depends on the rotational position of the head. If I put it in this axis to the trace we're trying to measure, it measures basically nothing. But you rotate it like that and you get the full Current. Yeah, you can measure the current flowing through the trace. It's brilliant. There's nothing else on the market like it. So if you need something like this, you need it. Now, its bandwidth is actually not too bad. It's better than the current probe we saw before. It's actually uh, 5 megahertz, um, but it has, you can actually set the bandwidth down to 500k or even 2 hertz down here, and you can adjust the uh, trace position uh, up and down on your scope and also the sensitivity. And it's got three different modes. One is uh, wire, comes with this um, ferrite clamp you put on there and it works just like a current probe. So that actually contains the magnetic field in there and you're in wire mode. So that makes it act like, just exactly like a, a current clamp probe. And I'll do exactly the same thing I did before is uh, measuring the oscilloscope waveform and bingo, there it is. It's exactly the same waveform and you can calibrate uh, the thing. The only disadvantage is it is a bit more uh, like dependent upon where the wire is in there. So if I move it like that, you can see the amplitude does change a bit so it's not quite as accurate as a proper uh, current clamp probe but you know it, it does a reasonably good job and the next mode is the uh, PCB trace mode that we actually saw so you know when the current flows through the uh, trace there and here's where you have to adjust the sensitivity and yeah, it's a little bit how you're doing it's not like it allows you to see the waveform but actually get in it calibrated that's much trickier but the value in this is actually being able to see the actual waveform you don't necessarily same with uh, most current probes you just want to see the waveform you don't really care too much about the absolute accuracy of it and the final mode is uh magnetic fields and you can measure those directly in uh micro tesla so if we go to the manual here we can uh, just have a quick squiz at it uh yeah as i said like a dc to five megahertz uh like the noise e equivalent in a uh, toroid uh, six milliamps rms so it's not for you know really low current measurements just like most uh, magnetic uh, current probes and then the magnetic field measurement uh scaling you know 250 micro teslas 200 amps per meter uh per volt output and uh in wire mode um plus minus 10 milliamps to plus minus 10 amps and of course uh, it's basically isolated so you can actually stick this thing right into the guts of a switch mode uh, power supply you know it does have like bare wire voltages and cat ratings and stuff like that but you know like look at it right <laughs> you can do your hands all the way back here stick this right right up the clacker inside you know down through the transformers and all the filter caps and all the heat sinks alive heat sinks and everything else stick them inside your power supply and uh, you're safe as and you can see here that, you know, for like PCB sensitivity, it's not completely linear, like, but you know, good enough for Australia. At least you get to see the waveform. Now, I couldn't be asked to set up another, uh, like, experiment just to demo this. I've done a demo of uh, where you can actually use this to trace higher frequency signals through a PCB power plane. You can do lots of other cool stuff like that. So I'll just um, steal uh, the video, the segment from my uh, previous video. Here it is now, linked in down below. Hi, it's product review time. Now what I'm going to do is try and attempt to trace out a real ground current on a PCB like this. And as you can see, there's a split PCB plane in there. So I've got my uh, current going in over here, coming out over here, and it's got to go through that tiny little trace down in there. That's the only way that it gets from there through to there. There's the split ground plane there, so we shouldn't get any current flow around in here. We shouldn't get any current flow in the ground fill down in there. We shouldn't get any current flow down in here. We should just get the current flowing through there, through that tiny little trace there, if you can see it, and down around through to here. Now I'm using a one kilohertz signal here, but it would work for uh, DC as well. But uh, just remember, you've got the Earth's uh, magnetic field as well. So when you move this thing around, you know, 
we, you, we, you're going to get an offset uh, shift like that. So just be careful. But here we go. There's our reference waveform. And we don't have to worry about the calibration on this pot at all. Because we we're, we're, don't care about the magnitude. We're just tracing currents here on this board part of the ground plane. And you'll see we've got absolutely nothing there at all. We can change the orientation and we get that offset. But there's no one kilohertz signal. There's nothing flowing through that part of the ground plane. But here, there most certainly is. Once again, if we get the wrong orientation, it's going to vanish like that if we hold it vertical. But if we keep the correct orientation according to the magnetic field of how it should flow, then bingo, we still get the waveforms. See the currents going both sides of that hole there, here like this. And once again, it does some of it does flow down around there like that, but the majority of it's going to flow through this top part here, and it's going to flow up here. And you'll notice that it won't flow down into that little fill, that little void down in there. There is no current flow there at all. So you can see the current flowing through here, and likewise, there's going to be nothing flowing down here. They're electrically shorted together, but there's no current flow. And this is a great visualization uh, learning tool as well as a real practical tool for determining where your currents are flowing in your ground planes. And there it is flowing down there. And it's look, it's not going down this little bit down here. Very little down there at all. Tiny little bit flowing through those two pads there. But as you can see, it's all going to flow through that trace there, that one tiny little trace which connects the two split ground planes, and it's going to flow up here and all the way over to there. And look, down here, there's nothing in this little void down here. Zero that out. There's no current flow through any of this stuff down here because that's where it flows, through that bottleneck there, around here and down into there. So yes, this thing uh, isn't cheap, but it's unique and there's nothing like it. So I'd recommend this if you're doing like lots of uh, mains, big switch mode power supply design and stuff like this, just being able to get in there and see waveforms just without dicking around. Uh, it's worth its weight in gold. And the last probe, we've got the EMC probe. Of course, I've done like, what, half a dozen videos on <laughs> using EMC probes. So like, yeah, I've already spent enough time on this video. I won't go through it again. I've even done a video on how to make your own one for like, what was it, 10 bucks or something um, like that. So 10, $15 or 20 bucks. Um, yeah, you can make your own. Uh, of course, you get magnetic ones like this, which actually have the uh, loop and you get them in different loop sizes. And this one here actually has a loop in there. So these are called H-field or magnetic field probes. And then this one here is called an E-field or electric field probe. And well, I've done very interesting videos on the differences between magnetic and I've demonstrated the magnetic uh, and electric fields and things like that. But great for doing uh, EMC, uh, electromagnetic uh, conformity, uh, pre-compliance for your uh, products. And generally uh, the output levels of these are very low. So you use a wideband RF uh, signal amplifier. In this case, this goes up to uh, three gig uh, from uh, TechBox, and but you can, as I said, like you can just make your own out of a bit of coax. There's basically just a bit of coax in there, and that's it. Um, and you can buy these amplifiers for like 10 bucks on eBay. Uh, well, not this one, but like a little bare board one. Um, and uh, Bob's your uncle. You've got yourself a EMC pre-compliance. Very handy for like tracing down uh, EMC faults and things like that. Once again, I'm not going to set up experiments again just to uh, demo this. I'll link in my EMC uh, videos. But that is another different type of probe. Highly recommended. You should have one just because, like, just make one yourself. I mean, this set costs, you know, a couple of hundred uh, bucks, and it comes with, like, the calibration charts and everything else, and uh, which is fine. But these do-it-yourself ones, once again, for 10, 20 bucks, just like uh, your... Uh, here it is. Just like your uh, transmission line resistive uh, probe down here. I Like, why not? Just have a couple of these made up for when you need them. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this uh, little two-part series on looking at all of the different types of uh, probes available for oscilloscopes. There might be other obscure ones out there. Please leave it in the comments down below if you uh, think I've forgotten something uh, important or something exotic like this, you know, eye probe uh, thing. Uh, there are other, I'm sure there are other exotic oscilloscope probes out there, but I think I've pretty much uh, covered, uh, you know, all of the um, general ones that you're going to find or have potential use for in the future. So yeah, you've got your times one times ten switchable probe with your scope, but there's a lot more 
out there um, that allows you to do all different types of measurements under lots of different scenarios that you might encounter in uh, electronics. So I hope you like that and if you found it useful please give it a big thumbs up and as always discuss down below in the comments over on the EV blog forum. Each video has its own forum link uh, linked in down below where everyone discusses this stuff and of course you can check me out on the other platforms where I occasionally uh, release exclusive material. Not on YouTube. Mm. Catch you next time.